Hello everyone and welcome to another video on our own devices. I'm Jean Massier and today we are having a look at a deceptively simple device whose inner workings have proven remarkably difficult to work out and indeed remain the subject of considerable debate to this day. This is known as a Crookes radiometer and it consists of a partially evacuated glass bulb inside of which are four metal veins painted white on one side and black on the other suspended on a low friction spindle so that they can rotate freely in the horizontal plane. And how this works is if I shine a light on the radiometer, the veins will begin to spin. And the speed of rotation is directly proportional to the intensity of the light, hence the name radiometer, something which measures electromagnetic radiation, or in this case, visible light. However, these aren't used as scientific instruments, but rather as desktop toys or as educational aids. Now, the radiometer was invented in 1873 by the British physicist Sir William Crookes, and longtime viewers will recognize his name because he was also the inventor of the spintharoscope, the device for directly viewing radioactive decay that we covered in a previous video. He's probably most famous for developing the Crookes tube or the cathode ray tube, which led to the development of multiple technologies, including television. And he was also the discoverer of the element thallium. And indeed, it was during his research on thallium that he came up with the radiometer. So Crookes was weighing minute samples using a highly sensitive vacuum balance, which was encased in an evacuated chamber so that small air currents wouldn't affect the readings. And during the course of this research, he noticed that samples seemed to weigh more when they were exposed to sunlight. Now, his initial hypothesis was simply that the balance beam was expanding as it absorbed light and heat and thus created a longer moment arm and made the samples appear as though they were heavier. However, further experimentation show that this effect still occurred in the horizontal plane when gravity would be irrelevant. And this line of experimentation eventually led him to creating the radiometer as we know it today. Now, Crookes's initial explanation for how the radiometer worked, how light was able to make the vein spin, was that it was due to light pressure or radiation pressure, basically what we know today as photons bouncing off the veins. And this was predicted by James Clerk Maxwell, who of course came up with the famous equations for electromagnetic radiation. And apparently Maxwell was delighted at this practical demonstration of his principles and accepted Crookes's explanation. However, it didn't take long for that explanation to be completely debunked. That's actually not how a radiometer works at all. And there are a number of reasons for this. For one thing, if the operation of a radiometer was entirely due to radiation or light pressure, you'd expect that it would continue working even if the vacuum inside the bulb were absolutely perfect. Now, when Crookes conducted his initial experiments, he didn't have access to a vacuum pump powerful enough to remove absolutely all the air. But a couple of decades later, another scientist named Pyotr Lebedev succeeded in removing all the air, and he found that the radiometer simply stopped working. And indeed, it appears that a certain amount of low pressure gas is necessary to making a radiometer work. Too little and whatever effect actually spins the veins doesn't occur, too much air, and there's too much air resistance for that effect to fight against. There's just too much drag. And so this effect occurs from between 0.001 pascals and 100 pascals, with the optimum being around 1 pascal. Now, the second problem with the radiation pressure theory is that if it were true, you would expect that the white side of the vein would tend to reflect light, whereas the black side of the vein would tend to absorb it. And since an elastic collision transfers more momentum than an inelastic collision, this should drive the veins around with the white side trailing. But this isn't actually what happens. When you shine a light on a radiometer, the black side trails. So this goes entirely against that prediction of the light pressure theory. A third strike against the radiation pressure theory comes from the work of Johann Lambert, who in 1760 described the properties of ideal diffusively reflective and diffusively radiative surfaces, effectively idealized flat white surfaces that reflect and scatter light in all directions, 
and idealize flat black surfaces that absorb and re-radiate light in all directions. And if we assume that the veins on a radiometer approximate ideal Lambertian surfaces, these theories tell us that although initially the white side of the veins will be reflecting light while the black side will be absorbing it, after a certain transition period, the black side will start re-radiating all of that light energy. And when the system reaches equilibrium, both sides will be emitting the same amount of energy, meaning that there is no force imbalance, no torque, and no motion. Now, since I've run out of strikes to continue the baseball metaphor, I'll say that the final nail in the coffin for the light pressure theory came in 1901 when Ernest Nichols and Gordon Hull constructed what is known as a Nichols radiometer. And this is a torsion balance made up of very lightweight mirrors suspended on a fine quartz thread inside an evacuated bell jar. And this allowed them to directly measure the effects of radiation pressure. And they found that the force exerted by light falling on a reflective surface was far too weak to account for the motion of a regular radiometer. So that entirely ruled out radiation pressure as the chief explanation for how a radiometer works. So what then is actually going on inside the radiometer? Well, the next major theory to emerge posited that as the black side of the veins absorb light, they heat up and they heat up the air in their immediate vicinity. And this causes a pressure differential that pushes the veins around and while this seems fairly intuitive, it also falls apart under closer scrutiny. For one thing, the veins aren't a sealed piston inside a tube with high pressure gas on one side and low pressure gas on the other. That high pressure heated gas can actually spill over the sides. And as the radiometer starts moving, that gas would mix and it would reach equilibrium really quickly, eliminating the torque that would theoretically spin the veins. Secondly, in 1876, just three years after Sir William Crookes invented the radiometer, another scientist named Arthur Schuster showed theoretically that this effect would only occur if the mean free path, that is the average distance a gas molecule must travel before encountering another, was around the size of the bulb itself. However, at the pressures over which a radiometer actually operates, this isn't the case. The mean free path is measured in just a few millimeters. And although the gas molecules are moving faster and can contribute more energy to push the veins around, they're also more likely to collide with one another and block each other from actually reaching the veins themselves, meaning that these two effects cancel out and there is no net torque. Interestingly, no less a figure than Albert Einstein actually applied his mind to this problem, and he determined that although there is no net force on the faces of the veins, there is a small net force on the edges. This is due to the temperature differential across the edge of the vein. However, he calculated that this force was still too small to account for the rotation of your average radiometer. Now, various other theories have also been put forward to explain the operation of a radiometer, but all of these have also been debunked. For example, one early proposal was that as the black side of the veins heat up, gas from the inside of the bulb that has become absorbed into the paint is off gas, providing a reactive force that causes the veins to turn. Now, this has been disproven through the use of non-porous coatings on the veins, and also when you think about it, eventually you would run out of absorbed gas to propel the veins around, whereas a radiometer can continue spinning ad infinitum so long as you have a light source trained on it. Another early theory is that the reactive force is caused by electrons released from the surface of the veins via the photoelectric effect, which of course Einstein won his Nobel Prize for describing. But this has also been disproven through experiment. And finally, another leading theory was that the heating of the veins and the motion of the veins created convection currents inside the bulb, the horizontal component of which drove the veins around. But also this has been shown to not happen. Now the most commonly accepted explanation today for the operation of a radiometer was put forward in 1879 by one Osborne Reynolds, who those of you with aerodynamics backgrounds might recognize as the namesake of the Reynolds number, the dimensionless value used to describe the flow qualities of a fluid. And his explanation was based on a phenomenon that he discovered called thermal transpiration or thermal creep. 
And this is the establishment of a pressure differential between both sides of a porous surface caused by the differential heating of both sides of that surface. And just like Einstein's partial explanation for the movement of the radiometer, thermal transpiration is not a surface effect, but rather an edge effect. So the idea is that the molecules at the edges of the radiometer veins will strike at oblique angles. But since the molecules on the black side are higher energy and are moving faster than the ones on the white side, they will impart slightly more energy onto the edges of the veins and the force vector resulting from all of this will point away from the dark side and this theory not only accounts for all the force or torque needed to drive the veins, but also one of the more curious phenomena observed with the radiometer, which is that if you take a radiometer and put it in cold water or in a freezer, it will actually start to spin backwards with the white sides trailing. And it will continue to spin like this for a couple of minutes before finally coming to a stop. And Reynolds explanation for this is that when you stop adding energy to the system, the black side of the veins will become a black body radiator and start giving off energy in the form of infrared radiation. And in so doing, it actually starts to cool at a faster rate than the white side, which means that for a brief period, the white side of the vein will be hotter than the black side. And since the air molecules on that side will be faster than on the black side, the effect, this edge effect, this thermal transpiration will reverse and start pushing the veins in the other direction. But because you're not adding any more energy to the system, eventually the inside of the bulb will reach equilibrium with the outside environment, the flow of heat will stop, and the veins will also stop. Now, interestingly, since thermal transpiration is an edge effect, it stands to reason that if you could greatly increase the number of edges on a vein, for example, by drilling it full of tiny holes, you could increase the force and thus increase the speed of the veins. Now, so far as I know, nobody has ever constructed a radiometer like this, but it would be an interesting experiment to try out if you had the proper equipment. Now, Reynolds submitted his paper on this subject to the Royal Society in 1879, and it was refereed by none other than James Clerk Maxwell. And because he was the referee on the paper, Maxwell was able to immediately write a rebuttal where he agreed with the general theory, but criticized Reynolds's mathematics. And he was able to publish this way before Reynolds was able to publish his paper. So Maxwell's rebuttal to a paper that hadn't been published yet was published in 1879, whereas Reynolds' original paper was only published in 1881. And understandably, Reynolds was kind of pissed about this, but by the time he was able to write his own rebuttal, Maxwell had already died, and it was considered poor form to criticize somebody who was dead, so he never got to defend himself. So this is where most people would probably end the video, since, as I said, thermal transpiration is currently the most commonly accepted explanation for how a radiometer works. However, in the course of my research for this video, I came across an even more compelling explanation. This comes from a paper by Jerry Z. Liu of Stanford University, and he conducted a number of remarkably simple experiments that cast some serious doubt on the legitimacy of the thermal transpiration theory. So what he did was rather than expose the radiometer to a large diffuse light source like a lamp or the sun, he instead used an LED flashlight to focus a narrow beam just on the veins themselves. And what he found was that when he started off shining the light on the black side of the veins, the radiometer started up and spun as per usual. However, when he shone the light first on the white side of the veins, nothing happened. Didn't matter if he left it there for hours, the veins simply didn't move. And when he repeated this experiment with a radiometer of higher quality that had a lower friction bearing on it, the veins did move, but curiously, the white side of the veins moved towards the light, they chased the light. And this movement only continued for a very brief period before the radiometer stopped. And then when he removed the light, the radiometer reversed directions and spun in the opposite direction just for a brief period before it again stopped. And this is not explainable via the thermal transpiration theory. So instead, Lou came up with an alternate theory based on electrostatic repulsion. And how this theory goes is that 
When the black side of the veins absorb light and energy, it causes electrons in the atoms of the paint to jump up to a higher orbital. And this creates an electrostatic repulsive force that pushes away the gas molecules in the immediate vicinity, and that creates a repulsive force that pushes the veins around. And it explains a lot of the unusual phenomena that he observed. So, for example, he found that when he turned on the light, when it was aimed at the black side of the vein, the response time was far too fast to be accounted for uh, by the heating of the air around the vein. The vein started moving way too quickly for there to have been time for the air to start heating up to the point where thermal transpiration could occur. However, if this was an atomic level effect of electrostatic propulsion, this would occur almost instantaneously. Also, it explains the weird phenomenon of the white side of the veins chasing the light and then the veins reversing as soon as the light is removed. So what he theorizes here is that when you shine the light on the white side of the vein, the infrared radiation from the light is scattered and bounces off the inside of the bulb where some of it is absorbed by the black side of the vein. And this causes an increase in energy on the surface. This causes this electrostatic repulsion. And so the vein turns in the same direction as it would if you shone light on the black side. And then when you remove the light, what's happening is the same as if you put the radiometer in a freezer. You're no longer adding any energy to the system. And so the black side of the vein is going to start radiating black body radiation. It's going to cool down relative to the white side. And so now the white side is hotter than the black side. It's going to cause more electrostatic repulsion and you get a reversal of the force gradient. It's going to push the veins around in the other direction. Uh, in both cases, both in one direction and the other, the system is eventually going to reach equilibrium with the outside environment. And when it reaches equilibrium, there's no longer a force gradient. The veins stop. So all of this makes for a very compelling new theory as to how a radiometer works. But it also goes beyond that with Lou in his paper positing that this repulsive force is also responsible for Brownian motion, which is the movement of fine particles suspended in water, and also the phase transition of materials from solid to liquid to gas. He theorizes that this jump in electron orbitals provides the initial kick to move atoms and molecules away from each other and start a phase change. Now, time will tell whether this new theory will stand up to further scrutiny and experimentation and be accepted by the scientific community. I actually haven't found any papers replicating Lou's experiments or commenting on his methodology, but it just goes to show how much more there is to the simple radiometer than meets the eye. 150 years later, and we're still not quite sure how it actually works. Anyway, that's all I have for you today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you next time on another video on our own devices where we'll look at yet more practical and impractical devices just like this one. Until then, I'm Jean Messier. Have a great day.